Our next uh, speaker is Anya Zuravel Segal. Um, Anya is also a PhD student at Tel Aviv University. She holds degrees from Moscow State University and Tufts University in Boston. Her doctoral project focuses on Russian Jewish intellectuals in interwar Berlin. Um, and her main interest is uh, the juxtaposition of Jewish history, German history, and early Soviet history. Her talk today will be it's impossible to read. Um, from the Soviet Union to the Weimar Republic and back. Um, David Bergelson's uh, journey, 1921-1933. Anya, please. Thank you. It's so good to be here today. I feel like standing here is a combination of a year of work. Um, and I just want to thank you, the organizers. I know that so much effort went into putting this together and into having us all, you know, in this air-conditioned hall, fed and happy and, you know, being able to converse at ease at what, what is of interest to us. Uh, thank you to Viola and Katarzyna who joined me in the panel. Uh, thank you, Professor Oprashkinazi, the panel chair, and thank you, Professor Elizabeth Lunds, who is joining us via Zoom from Chicago. Um, I will speak today about um, David Bergelson, a Yiddish writer active in the Russian Empire, in Germany, and in the Soviet Union in the first half of the 20th century. He lived in Berlin for 12 years, 1921 to 1933. My paper focuses on his ideological conversion during his stay in Germany. From an emigre critic of Moscow's policies, specifically policies related to Jewish culture, he became a leading um, spokesperson for the Soviet Union in the world of Yiddish letters in the interwar era. Now, his life story is emblematic of more life stories of people in his cohort, because during his time in Germany, he stood... Um, um, really at the center of an entire group of Soviet Yiddish writers who moved to the Weimar Republic in the early 1920s. Like him, other writers in his circle became pro-Soviet in Berlin. Like him, they all eventually went back to the Soviet Union. And like him, they all perished in Soviet labor camps and prisons. The two pictures you see on the slide here are, you know, could be of uh, two different people. The first picture was taken in 1930s, uh, the early 1930s, and the last picture was taken in a Moscow prison in 1949 after Bergson was arrested and prior to his execution. Um, exploring Bergson's life story and examining his ideological shift will point to dilemmas of his entire intellectual cohort in interwar Germany. So let us establish the timeline First, um, the writer was born in Sarny in today's Ukraine, then the, Ru the Russian Empire, in 1884. He leaves Moscow for Berlin in 1921. In 1926, he comes out very strongly in support of the Soviet Union, and that really, um, that's really the, the time when he um, announces his loyalty to the, to the Soviet regime. Um, he left Berlin for Copenhagen in 1933, and then after a year-long sojourn in the Danish capital, he went back to the Soviet Union. He was <clears throat> never to leave the Soviet Union again. He became very actively to promote um, the USSR in the world of Yiddish letters, but he did it from within the country. Um, and eventually he was executed by Stalin's decree in August 1952 during... Um, an event now known as the Night of Murdered Poets, because on that night, um, 13 uh, leading Soviet Jewish intellectuals um, were shot on trumped-up charges of espionage. Now, most research related to Bergelson and his circle is dedicated to their literary heritage. Um, and, you know, maybe rightly so, because they spearheaded the development of uh, Yiddish modernist literature, um, and they created an entire body of work uh, you know, that is studied by literature scholars, um, and specifically Rachel Zelik and Mark Kaplan um, and Mikhail Krutikov have, have looked into the literary uh, work over the past decade. But the writer's political conversion to a full-scale supporter of Bolshevik cultural policies 
has yet to be explored in detail. So I will, what I will try to do in this paper is I will look at his ideological shift and I will try to show how the context of Weimar Berlin enabled the shift and um, made it you know, particularly suitable for hosting this ideological conversion. But let us first look at what preceded this story. Um, life in post-revolutionary Russia was hard. Um, and here we see one of the soup kitchens uh, managed by the joint um, in Soviet Ukraine. And um, Yiddish writers, just like the rest of the population, were starving. Um, they were concerned about potential violence because the memories of pogroms, the civil war era pogroms in the Pale of Settlement was still fresh. Um, and in May 1920, a group of Yiddish writers based in Moscow, Bergelson among them, turns to uh, the American colleagues for support. They send them an open letter, and among other things they said, our strength and energy are at an end. We are unable to endure any longer want, hunger, and a constant fear of pogroms. They called out, help, help us come to a great Jewish settlement to America. American Jewish writers send them $100 in care of the joint. And instead of America, Bergelson and a number of colleagues made their way to Berlin. Now, at that time, hyperinflation in Germany drove production costs down significantly. Um, and this meant that um, uh, uh, printing and publishing was all of a sudden quite cheap for anyone who came in with even a minimal foreign investment. That drew multiple migrant intellectuals to the German capital and a whole lot of publishing houses that produced literature in, in not only in German but also in, in Russian and in Hebrew and in Yiddish opened up. And Berlin was at the heart of this, uh, of this enterprise. Um, a Yiddish publishing house, Volkswagen, offered Bergelson an advance on all fiction he was to ever write. Um, and Volkswagen was then based in Berlin. So the writer, traveling together with his wife and toddler son, made his way to Berlin in 1921. They had ample reasons to believe that life in Berlin would be more comfortable than in post-revolutionary Moscow. And it was. So what we see on the screen is a, is a rendition of the interior of the Romanisches Café, as portrayed in Babylon Berlin series. And if you haven't seen the series, you should. Um, the Romanisches Café, Café was a favorite uh, place uh, for Yiddish writers and Hebrew writers and all kinds of uh, Jewish literati uh, in Weimar era Berlin. And Bergelson was such a permanent presence there, a Stammgast, that he was called a uh, Bal Musaf of the Romanisches Café, you know, after the person who leads the afternoon prayer on Shabbat and often is the same person uh, week in and week out. Um, Bergelson's family settled in Zellendorf, a nice sort of middle class, upper middle class suburb of Berlin where his wife's um, relatives owned the house. Um, and Bergelson really blossomed. He wrote every day since his family was part of a larger wave of Russian immigration and specifically Russian Jewish immigration that made home in Berlin during that time. He had many colleagues that passed through the city or settled down in the city. Um, and this placed him right at the crossroads of multiple cultural worlds. He was very outgoing, so he had friends in the, in the Yiddish lit literary sphere, um, among German Jews, and also among Soviet expats. There was a growing Soviet community grow, uh, in Berlin uh, in the early 1920s. Uh, and this is how his son, who came to Berlin as a toddler, toddler and grew up in the 20s, uh, recalls uh, recalls a party um, in his uh, parents' house. Now, the list of who, you know, people who attended the, uh, the Bergelson home in Zellendorf really reads like the who and who of Weimar Germany. But, you know, pay attention to the Soviet uh, presence. Um, and the Soviet connection is not a side story here. Um, it really has central importance. Um, the Soviet presence was very much felt in 1920s Berlin after the two countries, Germany and the Soviet Union, extended mutual diplomatic uh, recognition after the Rapallo Accords were signed in April 1922. Soviet embassy on Untred and Linden became uh, Moscow's most important diplomatic mission in Europe. And this is, the, this is the building. It no longer exists. It was bombed out during the Second World War. But while it existed, it employed 
um, thousands of people, uh, not everybody sat here, but people who were connected to the building were not only diplomats, but also intelligence agents uh, and people who dealt with kind of soft diplomacy, cultural diplomacy between the Soviet Union and the Weimar Republic. Um, the Soviet Union ran a major public relations campaign from here, and especially courted intellectuals. Literature was a tool to influence the international public opinion, and Yiddish literature was watched particularly closely. Now, as we've seen, uh, Bergelson was not a vocal supporter of the Soviet party line when he came to Berlin. In fact, he used to publish articles in forwards like, um, with titles like Yiddish Kommunisten von Russland machen wieder Programm in Eufen Yiddish Gas. Uh, Jewish communists in Russia um, again make pogroms on the Jewish street. And, of course, comparing um, you know, the Yevsekce, the Jewish Bolsheviks, with, with people who instigated pogroms um, uh, was, um, uh, you know, said a lot during these years, um, in the early 20s, when memories of pogroms and the Pale of Settlement during the Civil War were still fresh. Um, yet he was sensitive to criticism coming from the Soviet Union, and he tried to limit his participation in projects that were deemed by Moscow to be petit bourgeois. Uh, but in spring 1926, really, a dramatic turn came. Um, he came out with a programmatic essay, Drei Zentren, Three Centers, uh, in which he professed that the Soviet government was creating new possibilities for Jewish artists. And he said, a combination of a substantial audience, institutional support, and a purpose in creating a future for Yiddish, to tie to revolutionary ideas, was to be found only in the Soviet Union. <coughs> Yet professing loyalty was not enough, and he had to amend for past sins. So during a trip to Moscow, sorry, in October 26, he had to account in public for his early ideological errors. He acknowledged the emptiness of all his earlier work and promised that in the future he will unite himself with the working masses and with the communist reality. This meant also that he had to give up his uh, job at Forwards, uh, where he was a Berlin-based correspondent. And Bergelson's family remained without income. And conveniently, the Soviet embassy offered his wife employment. Um, this is really the beginning of a, a pattern that we see here because employment of struggling Yiddish writers and their family members um, seems to have been relatively widespread. I found uh, three similar cases um, in Bergelson circle. And somehow job offers always came at a time when the writers lost all other sources of income. Uh, so literally the Soviet embassy uh, or the Soviet trade mission in Hamburg came out uh, you know, as a savior. Uh, and then what followed was that writers resolutely aligned themselves with the Bolshevik line. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the ability to find independent sources of employment became non-existent. So this is how the Soviet Union um, cultivated Jewish intellectuals. Now, this was particularly true for Bergelson, who was probably the highest paid Yiddish writer of his generation, uh, with influence that extended beyond the world of literature. Uh, he sat on all kinds of committees that promoted Soviet, um, you know, projects um, aimed at, um, uh, at the Jewish population of the Soviet Union. One such project was the uh, uh, agricultural um, colonization of Crimea, and then another pet project became creation of Birabidjan in the Far East, the Jewish autonomous region of the Far East, where a writer had a house built for himself where he never lived. Um, so compared to his peers in the Soviet Union, Bergelson, um, who all this time was based in Berlin, was in a very privileged position. He traveled the world. He spent up to half a year at a time in the US. Um, he raised funds um, for uh, the Soviet projects. Um, and he wrote fiction that justified revolutionary violence. So he was a very highly available asset for Moscow. Um, now, he left Germany in 1933 together with his family. Uh, because, again, conveniently, this was no flight, conveniently his wife was transferred from the Soviet embassy to Berlin to the Soviet embassy in Copenhagen in the wake of uh, Machte Greifung, Hitler's coming to power. And after a year-long sojourn there, uh, the family went back to the Soviet Union. Uh, the writer was never to leave it again, and uh, eventually in 1949 he was arrested at his Moscow home and uh, executed on August 12, uh, 1952. Um, uh, in the basement of this very building. This is the um, headquarters of Stalin's secret police. 
uh, today's uh, Russia's Federal Secret Service, Federal Security Service. And this building also probably holds Bergelson's archives, which if they exist, if they were not destroyed during his arrest, which is plausible, if they exist, uh, they are uh, unavailable to researchers. And the earliest date where we might hope they will become available will be in 2027, once 75 years would have elapsed after the writer's execution, um, after the case was closed. So in the absence of primary sources, we don't know the details of who and how exactly cultivated Bergelson. But in any case, this was a strategy with massive returns for the US, for the USSR. Um, and today, the writer's name and names of his colleagues are on the martyrs list for all students of Yiddish cultural heritage and for the broader public concerned with 20th century Jewish history as well. And this is really how they're known and remembered mostly. But the discussion of the intellectual's complicity in the regime, as of now, is beyond the purview of academic discourse and certainly beyond the purview of today's paper. Yet I think that in order to unpack the story, we need to look beyond the tragedy of life loss and loss for Jewish and world culture. We need to consider the role the deliberate Soviet influence had on the life and eventual demise of this leading Yiddish writer. And I will sum up. We saw that the confluence of factors was at play during Bergelson's sojourn in interwar Berlin. First of all, it was an environment that still allowed for um, transfer of ideas and movement of people across borders. Travel between the Soviet Union and Germany was possible, and ideas, um, uh, ideas flowed relatively freely. Uh, combined with the material conditions of hyperinflation, this environment allowed multiple publishing ventures to flourish. And this further attracted migration of Jewish intellectuals from the newly formed Soviet Union. Further, a significant Soviet cultural presence enabled a strong pull toward Moscow among this group. This pull was aided by deliberate cultivation of Jewish intellectuals by the Soviet Union. And the case study I have offered is but of one person, yet it is emblematic for an entire cohort of Soviet Yiddish writers whose lives developed along a similar pattern. Pursuing the stories further will shed new light on the interplay of the early Soviet history, of German interwar history, and the larger history of Jewish culture in the interwar era. Thank you.